So welcome back. We have been looking at the problem of representation and we have been basically trying to decide as to what are the kind of predicates that we will choose to represent in our knowledge base. We have looked at unary predicates and relations between them. Now let us focus on binary predicates because that is where we capture the relations between entities in the domain. Now just as a recap, our focus has been on the choice of predicates. This is an older slide. I am just keeping it here so that you can go over it uh, before we move on to the next one. Our focus is that how do we choose a useful set of predicates in our language essentially. We do not want to do things like we do in by simply borrowing predicates from natural language because as we have discussed earlier, you can say the same thing using different uh, predicates. So, you can say loves, adores, dotes on, is in love with and that kind of stuff essentially. We do not want to have too many because that would mean having rules for every one such representation. And we also talked about what are the kind of things that we want to represent. Today, we will focus on relations between individuals. For example, we can say that Sumedha is a friend of Shreya. We will also focus on relations between name relations. So, for example, if x is a brother of y, then x is a sibling of y. So, these kind of these things, what are the relations we should choose, what are the predicates we should choose and how are they related to each other, how is brother related to sibling and that kind of stuff. We have already seen some examples of uh, antonyms and things like that. The other question that I have been talking about quite often is what should be the set of predicates in a domain essentially to make the representation compact and canonical. So, one question one can ask is that is there a complete set of predicates, complete in the sense that in using which you can express whatever you want to say. So, we saw for example, there were a complete set of logical connectives uh, using which you can ca capture all other connectives. So, likewise, is there a complete set of connectives uh, which you can use? Now, that is a difficult question to answer, uh, but we shall keep that at the back of our mind. So, clearly the choice of predicates is important. The more the set of predicates, the more the rules and the greater the complexity. We have been saying that. Can we define a conceptual domain which is independent of natural language terms? So, People do this to some extent that they build what are called as ontologies for let us say medicine or something else. So, our thinking should be also along those lines that in some domain whatever you want to reason about let us say it is a football match or if it is a bridge game or it is classrooms uh, and lectures uh, scheduling whatever it is you define a vocabulary to deal with those things and then try to map onto those things. So, can we have some sort of a conceptual level which we can define a set of actions and the actors, objects, effects and other relations for those actions, some sort of a canonical set. Now, such an attempt was made in the late 70s at Yale University by Roger Shank and his group and they attempted to define what is they called as a conceptual dependency theory, a set of concepts which are distilled from what we know the way we talk about the world in natural language. They had a very small set of concepts. We will look at that a little bit later, but uh, not at the moment. Their work kind of fizzled out in the 80s, mid 80s after that other kind of fads emerged into AI. So, there was this area of case based reasoning which became very popular which was easy to implement for industry and so on. Then of course, came the neural network and since then there has been a lot of attention on the neural network. But we will look at conceptual dependency a little bit later because the idea is definitely worth pursuing. For the moment, we talk about binary relations. So, let us begin with symmetric relations. 
we have already seen symmetry when we talked about equality. We said that equality is symmetric. If x is equal to y, then y is equal to x, which in clause form you would write as not x equal to y or y is equal to x. We need symmetry because even though we know that conceptually when we say x and y are equal, they are referring to the same object in the domain. Formally, in proof systems, if you want to match something with y is equal to x, 5 is equal to 3 for example, not sorry, 5 is equal to 3, 5 is equal to x let us say, then you can match it only with 5 is equal to x, you cannot match it with x equal to 5. But as we had seen in the examples earlier, that you can use the symmetry axiom which is this one here to convert 5 is equal to x into x equal to 5 and then maybe you can go ahead with your proof process. Other relations can be symmetric too. So, for example, being married is a symmetric relation. If x is married to y, then y is married to x. This is an equivalence relation. It goes in both directions. We can break it up into two implications, one from the left to right and the other from right to left. But that is kind of redundant because anyway these are variables, x and y are variables and by you know choosing different variable names, you could get both sides of the implication. The why, the reason why we may want to add knowledge like this which says that x is being married to y is the same as y being married to x because the knowledge base may contain only one direction of this whole thing. So, for example, it may be stated that Susan is married to Jennifer in the knowledge base. But the query that you get would be is Jennifer married to someone? Now, if you are married predicate, so our query is like this where Jennifer occurs at the first uh, argument and x is the second argument. But in the knowledge base, Susan is the first argument and Jennifer is the second argument. We know that if Susan is married to Jennifer, Jennifer is married to Susan. But we need to use the symmetry ax axiom to arrive at that answer essentially. So, we can if you are doing backward chaining for example, like in prologue, we would say the query that is Jennifer married to someone would be translated into is someone married to Jen Jennifer and then of course, you can match the fact that yes, Susan is married to Jennifer. Essentially. But there is a flip side to this that if this fact were not available, this fact that Susan is married to Jennifer was not in the knowledge base and if you were to ask this query nevertheless that is Jennifer married to someone, then we will continue to use the symmetry axiom in perpetuity. So, we will take this query is Jennifer married to someone, use the symmetry axiom and convert it into the query is someone married to Jennifer. Since we won't be able to answer it, we will again use the symmetry axiom and reconvert it into is Jennifer married to someone and as you can imagine this process will go on and on and that is why uh, programs can go into infinite loops. As we had discussed when we were talking about prologue, modern compilers can try to catch such loop loops and stop them from going into an infinite loop. Now, we are talking about marri marriage and so we want to represent knowledge about our notion of what is to be married. Uh, I mean not in terms of experience, but in terms of the relations that we are talking about. So, for example, we, we can say who can marry whom essentially. Now, many societies they put all kinds of restrictions on that and let us try to address how we would add constraints to our notion of who can be married to whom. Now, marriage of course, is a social contract and so what are the constraints that we can impose? So, most people for example, would accept that you cannot marry your close relatives and there is a reason behind that which is that uh, you do not want the same genetic information to get propagated and become narrow and narrow essentially. It is speculated that in Egyptian royalties, they used to marry their siblings essentially. The kings used to marry their sisters for example. But as I said a little while ago, tradition disallows it. In most societies, you cannot marry close relatives 
and science also discourages it because it has a uh, impact on your genetic makeup of the child essentially. So, just to illustrate how we could add some constraints as to who can marry whom, we will give you an example here which is that if x is married to y, then x cannot be a sibling of y. That is almost universally accepted essentially. So, we would express it like this that if 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 it if both were true, if married x y was true and, and sibling x y was true for some x and y, then the knowledge base would be inconsistent. We can also put a simple condition that marriage is defined amongst human beings, that uh, the notion of marriage is defined over the set of humans. So, the only constraint we are saying is that x must be human and y must be human. So, we can add that in our knowledge base and it will check for consistency essentially. So, for example, if somebody says that this person is married to a tree or something, then you can point out that no, oh, there is something wrong with that. But of course, we need to define what is it to be human. So, I am giving you a choice of two definitions here and I will leave it to you to think which one is more accurate. The first one says uses the inclusive or, the second one uses the exclusive or essentially. The exclusive or definition says that you are human if either you are a man or you are a woman. The inclusive or definition says that you are human if you are a man or if you are a woman and notice that the inclusive or keeps the possibility of somebody being both open. So, it is a matter of definition how do you want to define it and I will leave that to you to think about it. So, here we are defining human in terms of the categories man and woman which we assume are well defined. Now, there can be inverse relations as well. Uh, just like there are symmetric relations of being married, there are inverse relations. For example, the parent child relationship is an inverse relationship. So, we can say that for all x y, parent x y is equivalent to saying child y x essentially, which we can again break down into two implications. Parent x y implies child y x and child y x implies parent x y essentially. Like in the case of symmetric relations, the reason why we may add these kind of extra pieces of information is because the facts may state it in one form. The fact may say that Susan is the parent of Jennifer for example, as shown here, but the query could be who is Jennifer the child of. So, the query is of the form there exists an x such that Jennifer is the child of x. So, again we should be able to go through these two predicates to arrive at the right answer and again there is a danger that if the fact is missing, then we keep we could keep going back and forth between parent and child. Jennifer is the child of someone, that means someone is a parent of Jennifer, that means someone is Jennifer is a child of someone and so on. We could go into an infinite loop. We would like to get out of such infinite loops. We have talked about disjointness that you can be either one thing or you can be the other thing and in the slides that we are going to use from now on, we will use capitalized names for variables in the style of prologue and we will use lowercase for individuals or constants. So, if you remember the surgeon story, we had uh, mentioned that x is a parent of y, then x can either be the mother or x can be the father and our reasoning was based on this essentially. So, we should faithfully represent this as if the son of x is y, 
then x is the mother of y or x is the father of y, but both cannot happen at the same time. So, the ex exclusive or is the correct way to represent that. Now, as an exercise, I will ask you to take this expression which is in first order logic and reduce it to clause form, which is what we use when we were talking about the resolution method. And you will see that this breaks down into a whole set of clauses and any one of them is a true statement. So, these are some of those clauses that you can uh, derive from there or they are equivalent to that or they can be derived from there. So, the first one for example says or the second one says that if x is the if the son of x is y and x is not the mother of y then x must be the father of y. So, you can make such inferences using this fact which says that you can be either the mother or the father essentially. And there are other implications I would encourage you to explore what other things are there. So, for example, this itself could be a true statement that if x is the mother of y then x is not the father of y. That is what we wanted to say that if, if, if somebody has a son then either they are his mother or they are his father but not both. But this this sub fact is also true essentially. So, think about this and we will come back and look at some more binary relations between two people that we can define and to a large extent there are many things in logic that we would want to do would be expressed in terms of binary relations.